very much. And please keep the talking to a minimum, like none. With that being said, I'd like to begin. My name is Amelia, Amelia Earhart. I am an aviatrix, but I did many different things in my life. I was born on July 27, 1897, in Atchison, Kansas. I was raised by both my grandparents and my parents. My pa grandparents were, in fact, extremely wealthy. And, um, well, what they would do is they would tell me that if I had a suitor, I wasn't allowed to date him or marry him unless he made a certain amount of money. Well, when my husband came to me, before he was my husband, and asked me to marry him, he had to go and ask my parents for permission. And they, in fact, my, I'm sorry, my grandparents for permission, and they, in fact, said that he had to make $50 in order to marry my mother a month. $50 a month. This took him three years to obtain that goal. So, he wasn't overly ambitious, but he was a wonderful father. Growing up, I was extremely, extremely into all sorts of sports. If it was running and playing, and pushing and shoving, and adventure, I was there. In fact, one time when I was at my grandparents' house, and we were sledding, I was sledding down a giant hill. And instead of stopping at the bottom of the hill when I saw a horse pull up, I decided to aim right for the middle of the horse's legs, and I came right out the other end, and I was quite impressed with my uh, skills, and I didn't hurt myself or the horse in any way. I gave my grandmother a bit of a scare, but that definitely started me off on my road of adventure and my desire to find and explore new things. As I was growing up, because my father was unable to hold down jobs, I lived in about 17 places throughout my entire life. In fact, as I was older, people would come up to me and say, I'm from your hometown. And I would look at them and say, oh, that's wonderful. Which hometown is that? Because I couldn't keep them straight. By the time I was in high school, we were in Chicago, and I was going to Hyde Park. And I had decided that I didn't want to be in the social scene, and I wasn't going to make a lot of friends. And in the yearbook, I was referred to as the girl in brown who walked alone. But because I didn't socialize, it didn't mean that I didn't participate in class activities and school activities. In fact, one of the things that I did was, because World War I was happening, and America wasn't involved in that at the time, but the world was, I told that people that we needed to have a smaller class ring, and that we would save the money and donate it to the military. That was a very successful endeavor, and we were able to give a lot of money to the Canadian military. After I graduated, I went to a private school for girls. Then my mother and I decided to move to California. And on December 1920, I was able to have my first flying experience, which meant that I was a passenger. I did not actually fly the plane. And the gentleman who was my pilot was a little bit leery about having women actually in a plane, so much so that he had another man sit next to me in case I decided to get a little queasy and jump out of the plane in the middle of flight. I thought, I was a little offended by that, um, but I was hooked on flying. From that point on, all I could do was think about what kind of jobs I could get to make the money to buy my own plane. Within a year, I had saved up enough money to purchase my own plane. I called it the Yellow Canary. It was a nice little yellow sports plane. And I was starting to set records. I had set over 17 records by the time I had sold my little yellow canary. From height records, to distance records, to speed records. I rode in an auto gyro, which is kind of like a helicopter plane. And I set a speed level record in that. And then we decided that it was time to move back to Massachusetts. So I sold my plane and we moved back to Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, I worked at what was called the Denison Home which was a home where people who came to America could live and could learn to socialize in the American way and speak English and find out where doctors were and where schooling was. We worked with a lot of people who were from China and Saudi Arabia and um, needed to come in and find out how to become Americanized. I became a social worker. At this point, I had 
still flying on my mind, but I thought that I truly had found my calling being a social worker. Well, about this time, Charles Lindbergh had uh, did his flight across the Atlantic, and everybody was all excited about flying across the Atlantic. And that was a race to get the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. Well, on 1928 of April, I received a call from a publisher who was J.P. Putnam, who publicized Charles Lindbergh's flight. And he had asked me if I would be interested in being a passenger flying across the Atlantic. Well, of course I would. Whether I was the only one who didn't get paid, I was fine with that. There were three of us who flew, two men and myself, and I received no money for that. But a lot of fame and a lot of inspiration to others. As time went on, I wrote a book about this experience called 20 Hours and 40 Minutes. I became an author. I was hired by Cosmopolitan Magazine. I became a fashion designer. I lectured. And I eventually ended up marrying my publicist after his first marriage ended, and I became Mrs. J.P. Putnam. And we moved to Hollywood, where I met one of my really good friends, Mary Pickford. And one day when my husband and I were sitting at the kitchen table, I looked at him and said, you know what? I think I need to do something that's bigger than I've done before. I want to fly around the world via the equator. No, this has never been done before. And he thought I was absolutely insane. He then immediately started contacting all the places I would have to stop, getting permission to meet and fly over those zones. We were in the middle of war, and people didn't take kindly to a woman pilot or a woman pilot flying over their no-fly zones. They had to make sure we had no guns or no ammunition. We hired a staff. I ended up only going with one other gentleman, Fred Noonan. This is the plane I rode it, I drove in. It was an Electra, and it was funded by the university that I worked for. Um, in 1937, I took off. I made it more than three-fourths of the way around the world. The second to the last stop I had was this tiny little island right here called Howland Island. It was a mile long and a half a mile wide. It was not inhabited, and it did not have a landing strip on it. After 20 hours of flying over Howland Island and not being able to see it because we had no Morse code, we had no global satellite positioning like we do now, I tried to make contact. The last contact that I think they heard was that I was directly, I thought I was directly over them but could not see them, and that I was flying north and south. I never received any communications back. They had the largest search for any American to date for me. My husband spent our entire family fortune on looking for me for two years. They never found any remains of me. They have no idea what happened to myself, my navigator Fred Newton, or our plane. Most recently, they thought that they found one of my pinky fingers and a compact, but it was not mine. It was tested and found to be inconclusive that it related to my family genetics. But I don't want you to remember me for the flight that I did not complete. I want you to remember me for all the things I did do. That I was a lecturer, that I was an author, I wrote over three books, that I was a writer, I wrote for Cosmopolitan, that I was an aviatrix, I was one of the first women to have a pilot's license to do to fly from California to Hawaii. And if you are ever in Hollywood, um, there is a statue of myself in Hollywood of a giant propeller. There is also a shrine to me in Atchison, Kansas. With that being said, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to my story and my life. And I would like to introduce to you Beatrix Potter, and she would like to share.